Since the beginning of the year, we've been preaching through the Bible in a different book, going chronologically from Genesis right on through. Last week, we finished up the Old Testament, and some of you were so happy. <laughs> Particularly as we had worked our way through the 12 minor prophets. That's, the, that's what the closeout portion of that is. Today, we begin the New Testament. We are in the book of Matthew, and we're talking about the kingdom of of heaven. It's a thing that comes up from time to time and people want to know what is the kingdom of heaven? What does it look like? What does it mean? Well, there's a great deal of scripture that gives us some wisdom insight here as to what the kingdom of heaven is. What I love about this passage today is these are Jesus' words, his stories, his illustrations to help us, help his disciples at the time, help us today to understand in more practical terms what the kingdom of heaven is and what it is not. Matthew chapter 13 is where we will be today. And let me give you just a little bit of insight about Matthew and who he was. Matthew was one of the 12 disciples slash 12 apostles that Jesus originally called, invited to follow him. Matthew was a tax collector by trade. Now listen, we have some folks in the house that work at the tax office. Don't get mad at them. Not at least while the service is going on. The thing about Matthew is it was in this day historically tax collectors and Matthew was, was a Jewish man living in a Jewish community in town, but he worked for the Roman government because Rome controlled all of the region and literally the Jewish people were under their control. You could call them slaves because they were to a degree. And so what Rome would do, they would hire Jewish people to collect taxes for Rome. The problem was tax collectors were known to steal from people. Now listen, some of you are saying, well, that still happens today. <laughs> we don't have time to talk about that. That's another issue. But the problem was you've got these Jewish people working for the Roman government, collecting taxes from their fellow Jews, friends, family, fellow church goers, and the list goes on and on and on. But they would charge a lot more if Jeremy came to pay his taxes. And I was working for Rome. I was the tax collector like Matthew was. And maybe he owed $20. I'm just throwing that out for illustration purposes. Maybe he owed $20 on his tax bill. Jeremy came up and said, oh, I'm here. I got, I, let me see if I can imitate Jeremy. I guess I got to pay it. I'm just kidding. And I, he says, how much, how much I got to pay? And I said, um, let, me, let me check, Jeremy. Let me check. Uh, $50 will cover it. That, that, that'll cover it all. And he's like, really? That's ridiculous. Only paid 40 last time. Okay, I'll take 40. And so the tax collector would skim the 20 extra and pay Rome the 20. Everybody follow me. So they were cheats. They were scammers. They were scoundrels. And typically they were wealthy people because of the way they did. And listen, Jesus knew Matthew was a tax collector and he still reached out to him and said, I want you to follow me. Why is that such good news? Because none of us in the house are qualified to be followers of Jesus. But no matter where you've come from and what your background is or where you're walking today, the invitation still is extended to you. Jesus said, come follow me and be my disciple. That's good news. Oh, I feel like preaching right now. This is, this is going to be good. It's going to be good. Now, Matthew, when Jesus called him, even though he had a lot of issues going on, let me tell you what Matthew didn't do like some of us. <laughs> he didn't say, well, I, I would I'd be glad to follow you, Jesus, and do what you want me to do, but I tell you, my schedule is just so busy right now. I'm not going to look at anybody in particular. But this time of year, you, you know, Lord, what's going on? I, I got a lot of activities and the hunting season's in and, and just, 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 just thought that was something you could relate to here. And the list goes on and on and on and on. Or, or I'm, not, I'm not as good at that as other people, therefore I'm not going to follow you and obey you. Listen, we have a tendency to look down at other people and their stories in the Bible and judge them when we oftentimes are more guilty than they are of not obeying. There's a cost associated with being 
a disciple. So let's look at the passage in which we begin the kingdom of heaven. The first one, Matthew 13, 24. Here's another story Jesus told we're, we're finding here. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed. Meaning he, he gave the best that he had. This wasn't junk. This wasn't scrap. This was good seed. He paid a premium price to plant this seed. The fields have been prepared. The hard ground has been broken up. This is an intentional act. And it says the farmer who planted the good seed in his field. But notice verse 25. But that night as the workers slept, meaning they were completely oblivious and unaware of what was going on, they've been in the field the previous day working, planting good seed in good soil. That night as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat, then slipped away. I want you to notice the, as the worker slept, he is speaking of the farmer's enemy came. They were not enemies of the workers in the field. Stay with me. They were enemies of the farmer. In just a few verses, we're going to see Jesus gets very detailed and he explains it. He said, I am the farmer who plants the seed. Let me say this as crystal clear so you have no misunderstanding. If you and I are planting anything other than good, godly, wholesome seed, then we are working for the enemy, which is the devil. You cannot plant seeds of discord. You can't plant seeds of gossip. You can't plant seeds of jealousy. And the list goes on and on and on and say, I'm working for God. No, you're not. Does everybody understand that? Thank you. It says, while the worker slept, his enemy came, planted weeds among the wheat, then slipped away. Please don't answer the question out loud, and please don't look at anybody you rode with today. But do you know people who seem like they cannot be happy or content unless they plant some weeds in somebody else's life? Oh. Notice another thing here. I never paid attention to this before. As they slept that night, the enemy came, planted the weeds among the weak, then slipped away. Here's what I never paid attention before. The next day, the following day, when the workers got up and apparently the task was completed, they did not recognize that foreign footsteps had been in their fertile soil and therefore they did nothing to prevent the weeds from growing. You and I would do ourselves a great service if we would pay attention to the footprints around us and who we have let into our perimeters. Because if you don't recognize the footprints, you don't know what's being sown into your fields. And it can create disaster Later, verse 26, and when the crops began to grow and produce grain. This didn't happen overnight. This didn't happen in a day or two. The several weeks have gone by through the process where the wheat's been planted. It has sprouted up. It's growing. It's green. It's lush. And it's to the point that it is about to produce grain. It says, and the weeds also grew parallel with them to them. Many passages say wheats and tares, and tares, by the way, are plants. They are weeds, but they are plants that look almost like wheat. Even the seeds in them look very similar to, to wheat, but the problem is they have poison in their seeds. He said the enemy came under the cover of darkness, slipped in, planned them, they grew right along beside of the wheat 
and nobody even recognized it. The wheat's to the stage where it's about to produce grain and the weeds are right there with them. Verse 27, the farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. Then they asked this question, where did they come from? Listen, I believe that's a legitimate question on their part, but the better answer or question is, what do we need to do about the situation? (laughs) The best question isn't, where did it come from? What are all the specifics behind it? What are the details? The question is, what do we need to do moving forward from this point? I hope you see this. Verse 28, he answers, he said, an enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. They ask this question, it's logical. They want to help, they want to do the right thing. Should we pull out the weeds, they ask. Now remember, the field is inundated with weeds that's mingled in with the wheat. Should we pull out the weeds, they ask. No, he replied. You'll uproot the wheat if you do. Here is a principle and wisdom on waiting on God's timing. How many of you will be honest like me? I've already got my hand up and say, situations arise and I'm a fixer, I'm a doer, and I like to move immediately and I'm ready to get in there and pull up the weeds and take care of business and put it all back like it ought to be. i got four honest people in there. Oh, there you are. Okay. Thank you. I'm not alone. Had there been an isolated weed or two or three, I suspect the farmer's response would have been carefully make your way through there because if they're going to navigate through the wheat, they're going to trample it down as they go, right? There were only a few weeds there. Perhaps he would have said, yes, gently and carefully go over and remove the weeds from the wheat. But it is so inundated with them that his advice is don't. Pull it up yet. Can I tell you there are times and situations, although you want to jump in with both feet and both hands and start weeding out problems and people that you think you're going to fix the problem, it will often do more damage than good if you do. That's a word of wisdom for somebody, including me. We often think we have the best response and the best answer to the solution when in fact, if we go in there and start yanking in the situation, we're going to destroy more good around it than we will just eliminating the one weed. Are you following me? But notice, his instruction to wait Listen to me. His instruction to wait in no way implies that he's not going to deal with the situation, the problem, or the people because he is. Notice verse 30. He said, let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them into bundles, and do what with them? Burn them And to put the wheat in the barn. Let me help somebody here today. You're in a difficult season, in a difficult place, and you don't have the answer or solution to your problems that you're in the midst of. And God has said, wait or hold on, let me deal with this. Can I tell you, ultimately, there's coming a time and a place and a season when God himself is going to make all things right. And the people and the problems that you've had to deal with that you don't have an easy solution to, God is going to put it in order in His time and in His way. Look at Matthew 13, 36. This is a follow-up to this story, this parable that He told the people. There's a little bit of time elapsed. Then He and the disciples get together. They're, They're alone away from the crowds. There's some further discussion about this very 
parable that he told, and he gives very clearly the interpretation so that there's no misunderstanding to it. Look at verse 36, Matthew 13. Then leaving the crowds outside, Jesus went into the house. His disciples said, please explain to us the story of the weeds in the field. Jesus replied, the Son of Man, which his own title that he gave himself on this occasion, so it is Jesus, is the farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the world, and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom, meaning believers, disciples, followers of Christ, the saved. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. I've already said, you can't plant weeds and be working for God at the same time. And here Jesus, when he was asked for further clarification, he said that the weeds among the wheat is the devil. He said the harvest is in the world and the harvesters are the angels. Just as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man, Jesus speaking of himself, will send his angels and they will remove from his kingdom, notice, everything that causes sin. Isn't that good news? Isn't it good news that one day as believers, there is absolutely coming a time that forever and ever and ever and ever, there will never be anything that you and I ever face or experience again that will cause sin. Isn't that good news? I wish you'd act like it. That's good news. But that's not the end of it. Not only will he remove everything that causes sin, notice, and all who do evil. I think that's why we didn't get excited about the first part, because that's attached to the second part. Most of my problems that tempt me to sin usually come through people. Thank you. Now listen, in no way am I blaming people for my actions or my behavior because I'm accountable to God for myself. But most often, my struggles that the enemy uses to create opportunities to sin come through people. You're saying, I wish you'd give me an example. I'm glad you want one. <laughs> How about today on the way over here, you were going down the road with your Sweet, happy family that you scrapped with for 30 minutes before you got in the car. Oh, all of a sudden you can identify. And on the way, and on the way from your marvelous transition and transformation from the house to the house of God, because, see, when I see you, you got to the door and you go, all right. <laughs> And between that time, somebody pulled out in front of you. Oh, it happened to three or four of you this morning, I can tell. And you had to slam on the brake, and all of a sudden you were tempted to sin in your thought processes and perhaps your mouth. If you've never been here with us before, we try to be as transparent and honest in the house. And so... The enemy works through people. He, he uses circumstances and all those things too, but most often I find he uses people. But notice Jesus said in that final day, in, in the future, everything that causes sin will be done away and all who do evil. Listen, this is not to hurt anybody. It's not to harm anybody. It's not to frighten anybody. It's not to condemn or judge anybody. But can I tell you, there will be no sin in Heaven and the only way for us to be sinless is putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Why is that so important? Because the answer is you're not even going to have to worry about what the kingdom of heaven looks like if you don't make things right with Jesus beforehand. He says in verse 42, And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing. That means grinding. There's pain and anguish there. 
of teeth, then the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Listen, some of you have been living depressed, suppressed, and depressed lives to the point you haven't seen the sun shine in your heart, your mind, your emotions, your spirit. But on that day when we make it there, you're going to shine like the sun. You're going to be full of radiance and peace and glory and happiness. I need to remind you, your future looks much brighter than your present does. As a believer, he says, anyone with ears to hear should, one, listen, secondly, should understand. Now, back to Matthew 13, 31, he's going to give us another illustration of what the kingdom of heaven is, another parable that we can relate to and understand. Matthew 13, 31, he said, here's another illustration Jesus used. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. I wanted my wife to fix this slide for me because you can see how small and tiny the mustard seed is. He says, it's the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of garden plants. It grows into a tree, which that is a mustard tree there that you see. And birds come and make nests in its branches. What is he saying? We may be considered small and insignificant in this life, but if we are a part of the kingdom of God, we will grow and develop and we will offer benefits to many other people, not just ourselves. I was interested to find this in my research this week, that mustard seeds are full of antioxidants that help fight cancer, arthritis, asthma, and high blood pressure. And can I tell you, that's a whole lot cheaper than going to the doctor or the pharmacist. But I love the fact he put in here, and the birds come and make nests in its branches. Listen, that little tiny seed eventually become a tree which offered a place of refuge and a place for something else to build its life upon. He said, and that's an illustration of what the kingdom of God is. That the lives that you and I are living are much bigger than what we see right here, right now. Listen, this is the sad truth of the matter. If you don't think you're having influence on people because you are, good or bad, I say it this way, I'm convinced you never have contact with another human being You either leave them better or worse. You never leave them exactly the same. We all have influence. And if you don't believe you don't have influence, have a significant issue, trial, or failure in your own life, and you will find out. People may not come to you while your life's going good and everything is up and to the right and people are happy with you and your bank account's full and the church is growing and being blessed. People may not care about you, may not speak to you. But let me tell you, if you mess up one time, everybody wants to get in your business. Point two, let's go to the next one. Got to move on. Matthew 13, 33, he's going to give us another illustration. I love the fact that Jesus told stories. I I, I love illustrations and stories. And Jesus did that because he knew we could relate to stories and we tend to remember them better. Verse 33, Matthew 13. He said, Jesus also used this illustration. The kingdom of heaven, there it is again, that description, is like the yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she put only a little yeast in three measures, which is about a bushel of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. Let me say it this way. Whether our actions and behavior is good or bad, no matter how small, it permeates every area of our life and impacts everyone around us. I love this fact that the yeast, the the primary reason yeast is put into bread to begin with as a leavening agent is it causes it to rise and expand. It makes it lighter and softer and gives it more flavor. There are a lot of us, even in this house this morning, that need the leavening agent 
and the power of the Holy Spirit to cause us to rise up greater than what we've been in the past to make us softer toward other people and to give us more flavor so we're more desirable. I know what some of you are going to do on the way home. You're going to say, I'll tell you one thing, that, that one point about, about the yeast and rising and making them soft and flavorful, that was really for you. I'll tell you that. He, he was really preaching to you this morning. That's what my grandson, who's here on the front row, just turned nine. But when he came along, and this, I mean, he was a little fellow, and I spent a lot of time with him as he was growing. And one day, my wife said this to me. She said, she looked at me so sincere. She, and, and just, I mean, she just, she said, she said, he has been so good for you. And I didn't understand what she meant, so I asked. Mistake. I said, whatever do you mean he has been good for me? She said, well, he has helped knock off a lot of the rough edges on you. I said, I ain't got no rough edges, woman. <laughs> but listen, that's the way the power of the Holy Spirit works in us. There are some folks came in this place flat this morning spiritually and mentally and emotionally and relationally. And you need just a little bit. Listen, it doesn't take a whole lot. You need a little bit of the power of the Holy Spirit infused to your life to cause you to rise from your low point. To expand your area, your influence. To make you softer and more gentle and kind around people. Don't look at me like you don't need it. I have met some of you. Let me get back to the word. But it permeates every aspect. Now, last, last parable, last illustration. One more. Matthew 13, 47. Here it goes again. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net. Not like a fishing pole, because a fishing pole's got a single line, single hook, usually a specific bait, type of bait, after a particular species. Part of the problem in our churches is, if we're going to fish for people at all, we want to use a singular line with a singular bait because we want only people that look like us, think like us, talk like us, act like us, and dress like us. Mm. Don't, don't lose me now. We're almost done. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven and the approach that the church needs to take is that we ought to be fishing for souls and people with a big old cast net. <laughs> the problem with net fishing is it's messy. Because when you cast a big old net and draw it in, sometimes there's stuff that you don't even want in the net. There's trash and debris and sometimes slime. And listen, even if it's full of fish, there are some fish in there that are not going to be good for you. So he gave this illustration to the disciples and it applies to us as a church today. He said the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net that was thrown into the water. Notice, and it caught fish of Every kind. Let me just throw this in real quick. In case you don't understand or know. We absolutely, would, we, we are called open door. We are here for any and everyone who wants to come and to worship and to find Jesus and to be a part of the kingdom of God. 
rich, poor, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, educated, uneducated, it does not matter. But hold on to your hat and your seat both. But if you are here for the reason to network and build your personal business, or if you are here to bring about strife and chaos and confusion and division, do I need to say more? I think you understand. He said, but they caught fish of every kind. He said, and when the net was full, the net, oh, look at, there's a net appeared here with some fish in it. Thank you, kind sir. Appreciate it. He said, and when the net was full, they dragged it up onto the shore. Can I tell you the implication is when they cast the net, there's a lot of stuff in it, including a lot of fish. It is heavy. It is weighted down. And there's some extreme work going into pulling it up the shore. Can I tell you, listen, I am thrilled, absolutely thrilled, thrilled, thrilled at the, at the work God's doing here at Open Door Bertie and the, and the expansion and the growth that's taking place. But can I tell you, more fish in the net means more work. And that means I need more of you involved in the work to keep pulling the nets in and doing the work of God. When the net was full, they dragged it up onto the shore. They sat down and noticed, and they sorted the good fish into the crates. There's a plan, there's a purpose for them, but threw the bad ones away. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like that. If you fish with a net, which you ought to. He said, we're going to salvage as many people and help as many people as we can. But occasionally, there's some you got just to throw out so they don't contaminate the rest. I know this is difficult for some folks. Just like, oh, that's not theologically sound. Well, yes, it is. This is the Bible. <laughs> Let me real quickly share with you some of the species of fish that may have to be dealt with, if you are one of these, let the Holy Spirit deal with you. I was interested to find out that there are over 32,000 species of fish that we know about. Of the 32,000 different species, over 1,200 of them are venomous or toxic. I think you know where I'm going. <laughs> but I begin to think about this process and, and fishing with a net and having to go through the process and help people find their place and their purpose in the kingdom of God. And then there are some people and some circumstances and some situations that we have to deal with that are not so good. One of the fish I want to talk about that we will have a problem with that creates a problem inside the church. First one, I'm, I'm going to talk. Oh, they darling. <laughs> the first one I'm going to talk about is a blowfish or a puffer fish. Oh, my Lord. What, what am I talking about? I don't know if you've ever seen or caught a puffer fish. I have. All you got to do is touch them the wrong way, much less rub up against them. And the more you get closer to them, the more they... <laughs> Many of the species of, of those fish are actually poisonous as well.
I'm like, should I just run through the list and be done or should I preach this message? Stop being so hypersensitive about everything somebody says or looked at you the wrong way. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. I remember a situation years ago. It wasn't in this church, but I was part of the other church. I remember a situation where a couple had been coming, and they were starting to get involved. as one thing or another, and all of a sudden they disappeared and didn't come. We followed up, and they didn't answer. We didn't go down there, and back and forth. And finally, we finally, finally, we were able to touch base with them face-to-face and ask and said, what in the world's wrong? You were here, and you were all in. Yeah, like, and you wanted to talk about joining the church, and all of a sudden you disappeared. What in the world's going wrong? This is what they said. Well, The, la- the last time we were there, the pastor's wife, I know that can be problematic, folks. I know that. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Anybody going toward Edenton after the service that I could ride with? <laughs> Wait around for me. They said the, pastor, the pastor's wife didn't speak to us. I'm like, what? What else? Look right ass. Didn't speak to us. <laughs> Puffer fish. Listen, here's another one. This isn't one, but it's going to represent one. Sharks. You understand there's sharks. Listen, we expect the sharks trolling outside the church, but not in the church. Not folks just cruising around looking for somebody in distress, looking for a weak victim so they can consume and take advantage of them. Here's one. How about piranha? There are people... You think they're mute because they never say anything, including singing or worshiping? (laughs) But you let them sense a little blood in the water. (laughs) I'm really trying to see how this is going over. Don't matter, I'm going to finish it. And they'll come and eat the flesh off of your very back. Because they don't have the courage to do it to your face. Hmm. How about this one? Large mouth bath. <laughs> You ever seen a large mouth bass whose mouth was bigger than his body? I haven't met some. <laughs> Starting not to put this one in, but I'm going to. I'm all in this morning. Crappy. They are going to complain. And leave a mess. <laughs> I'm gonna say it that way. Behind and on you if you will let them, because that's their nature. How about a clown fish? I just call them fools. That's biblical, by the way. It's in there. Flounder. People who just lay low, camouflage, blend in. That's all they ever do is just spend their time at the bottom. No commitment, no involvement whatsoever. How about swordfish or sawfish is a species? Listen. People get drawn into the church in the net sometimes when in fact they are swordfish or sawfish and they will spear you 
They will cut the legs out from under you. And wreak havoc on you. If given a chance. How about snakehead? Fish. Snakehead fish, I understand, are extremely, extremely difficult to get rid of. They can survive for days even outside of water, much less inside the water. And please, please don't, don't call anybody's name right now. Do you know any snakehead people that you just can't get rid of? I, <laughs> I know you do. I know you do. In addition to the other 1,200 species of poisonous or venomous fish. But I want you to notice the rest of the story. He said they sorted the good fish in the crates, but the bad ones they threw away. This is the way it will be, Jesus said, at the end of the world. The angels will come and separate the wicked people. That's the lost, the unsaved, the unrighteous from the righteous Throwing the wicked into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This has been a challenging message, and we're done, by the way, so you can relax. Greg, where are you? But I want you to listen to these summaries of the parables that Jesus shared, and we need to be reminded of them today. Listen, there are absolutely times and people and seasons that cause problems in our life and sometimes even in the church that we didn't create. But we don't have to be one of them. And and here's what I, I want to encourage somebody with today. We all at times have been the victim of and we all at times have been the cause of hurting other people by things that we said or that we did or that we failed to say or do. Haven't we? Haven't we all been hurt, offended at some point? Let's be honest, I'm going to wait for you. And at some point in time, we've all been guilty of being the offender. I'm going to wait on you because, yeah. Give you plenty of opportunity plus it'll wake some of you up. Jesus said, in this life, despite your best efforts at planting good seeds, sometimes there are going to be weeds that pop up that you're not aware of. And if you're not in a place that you can fix that, deal with that, it's beyond your control. He said to the disciples, he said, it's it's okay because there's coming a harvest time. There's coming an event, there's coming a season, there's coming a future time. He said, when I'm going to take care of that. Can I tell you that sometimes my greatest joy comes from being reminded that the problems and the people I can't fix in my own life or in the church, that God said, I'm going to deal with it eventually. Don't you worry about it. You, I, the church, should be busy casting the net for souls. It's our mandate. It's our job. Why would we not want to share this great news, this great environment, this great experience with other people? But we also have to understand that not everybody who comes in the doors come for the right reason. But Jesus said to the disciples, He said, even that, I'll take care of. I'll deal with it. There's coming a day when when we all are going to be sorted out. You're either wheat or you're weeds. You're either good fish or bad fish. And I say this 
out of genuine love and compassion, there is absolutely no middle ground. In that final day of judgment and reckoning, when we stand before God, we'll either hear Him say, Enter in, my good and faithful servant, to the joys of the Lord. Or we'll hear Him say, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. It's an important time. You're here this morning, you've heard the message, and maybe it's resonated in a way that you never saw it or understood it before, but you realize right now in this place, you never made a choice or decision to follow Jesus, and you understand when your judgment day comes, you're either wheat that's going to be harvested and used for the kingdom of God, or you're going to be a bundle of weeds burned. He said, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, you're not here by accident today. This is your opportunity. If that's you, you want to make a first-time choice and decision to follow Jesus. You don't have to understand all the Bible. You don't have to memorize it. You don't have to be able to quote it. Listen, you just say, you know what? I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I understand it's Jesus. That's the only way I can be right with God. You want to make that decision today. Just raise your hand right where you are. Don't be ashamed of Him. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I'll be available after the service if you want to talk to me, if you want to understand more. I'll be glad to pray with you and help you with that process. For the rest of us, you've heard this message today. You say, I'm ashamed to say it, but there have been times by my actions, my attitude, and my deeds that I have been guilty of sowing weeds into the lives of other people. I own it. I confess it. I want to make it right with God. And I want to stop that practice beginning right now. And you mean that. Raise your hand. I got both of mine up. Thank you. All over this place. Almighty God, we thank you for the simplicity the clarity and the power of your holy word that we have done our best to share today. I thank you for those who have responded to this word, this call, this invitation, to understand that eternity is in the balance for us. It's either heaven or it's hell. We are either in or we are out. Not by our good works, our good deeds, our generosity, or any of the things that we do. It is by forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ that we're made right with God our Creator. For those who have acknowledged that and responded today, I pray that you would help them to understand simple faith and trust in Jesus alone as Savior and Lord. His life has shed blood. His forgiveness for our sin. The sin debt's already been paid. It is a gift of grace from God. Lord, for the rest of us, who responded that we acknowledge there have been times and occasions when we have responded or reacted the wrong way and in doing so we have been guilty of sowing weeds into the lives of others whether we did it intentionally or unintentionally God many of us have acknowledged that we confess it we ask your forgiveness to cleanse us to wash us and Lord instead of planting and sowing weeds May we volunteer to work in your fields and sow good seeds for you. Thank you that you have reminded us that no matter our journey here in this life, no matter what our walk looks like, the challenges, the difficulties, the struggles, that you are with us and sometimes you give us the solution to the problem. And we do our best to obey that. And then there are times, as in this parable, that you say, no, just, just be still, just wait. Your attempts will create more problems than they will solve. Thank you for reminding all of us that there's coming a day that you're going to sort the wheat and the weeds yourself and give every person according to what they deserve based on their relationship with you. Help us, Lord, to be individuals and to be a church that always fishes with a large net. 
Lord, may we never be guilty of just being target specific where we're only pursuing one age group or one nationality, one ethnic group. But may we fish with a net that is large and wide and may we harvest many souls and as you are faithful to do that and continue to grow the work here send us workers and laborers and people who don't mind getting their hands dirty and bending their backs and are willing to do whatever's necessary to help land the nets and then sort through in the process and help identify the people who want to contribute to the kingdom of God Thank you that you are that loving, kind, gracious Father. We rejoice in that today. We honor you. We serve you. We celebrate you. Give you thanks for all that's been accomplished in this place today. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. We're about to share in communion this morning. If you did not receive a communion set, and you would like to participate, just raise your hand. We've got ushers all around ready to serve you. I don't want to leave anybody out. Anybody need a communion set? Front row. Right here. Or second row, I'm sorry. Second row. Second row. I can just say second row. We'll be glad to wait on you because, listen, communion, think about the word, is common union. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen, let me tell you, if you are a first-time believer, you made a choice and decision to follow Jesus during our prayer, and some of you responded. Can I tell you, you're part of the family of God now? We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We have common union together, and we want to celebrate that together. Anybody else need a set? Anybody? Still got right here, right here. Usher, right here. Anybody else? Listen, I'm not fishing for compliments, but isn't it great to come into a place where you just feel loved and cared for? Where people act like they want you to come back? Where you feel like a part of a bigger family? And the reason that happens is because we are a family together. Common union, communion. And that's possible through the work of Jesus. And so today as we partake of the bread, representing the life and the body of Jesus, God in the flesh, we remember, honor, and celebrate Him with this bread, the body of Christ. And on that night that Jesus shared the bread with His disciples, and He shared the cup with them, and He said, this represents a new way of doing business moving forward. I'm grateful with this crowd of folks. I'm grateful we didn't all have to bring a goat or a sheep or a bull or even turtle doves to be sacrificed. When Jesus came, He said, I shed my blood. He became the perfect sacrifice once and for all. And when He died on the cross, there was a great earthquake and darkness covered the earth that said that the veil in the temple, the thing that separated the holy place from the most holy place where only the high priest could go in once a year was torn in two, meaning we got direct access to God Himself through Jesus. I don't think we really understand what that means. That we can communicate directly with a holy, sovereign God who created us. And that's possible through the work that Jesus did. And our sin debt is 100% paid in full. Isn't that great news? And so today, we remember and honor and celebrate the shed blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for making a way. We could never 
be righteous in and of ourselves. We can never be good enough or do enough good. But you sent your son Jesus to die in our place and we honor him through this communion. Not only are our sins forgiven, our names are written in the book of life and heaven is our promised hope and eternal home, but we are born into a great big family with brothers and sisters that love and care for us. May this continue to be a safe haven of rescue, of hope, of forgiveness, of healing, of restoration for broken people, for your glory and for your honor. We give thanks. Amen.